Well, greetings once again. I'd like to pick up where I had uh, left off or was cut off yesterday on uh, my discussion about how I was called out, the pathway that I was uh, called on to take in this life. Uh, where we left off was after I came up over the big old mountain there in uh, Ohio, in West Virginia, where they meet. I don't know the name of the place, but uh, as I said, it's my steering box broke off from the axle on my Volkswagen van, but yet something guided me to keep me from dying because I certainly anybody else would have done that. They may have just went off the side of that mountain and who knows what would have occurred, but it looked like certain death. Anyway, I had pulled into the driveway. I had to kick the tires, you know, on the van, you know, in order to get them to move. And it took quite a while. I was sitting on the ground, you know, and just booting at it just to get it in the driveway. And then I had to boot it again in order to get it where it was at. I had got there about 3 in the morning or so, and uh, the farmer's house on the right-hand side of the road, all the lights were out, so I didn't want to bother him, so I just crashed out for the night. Well, in the morning, it was pretty bright and early. The farmer came over, and he was knocking on my window and woke me up, and he asked me if I needed anything, and I told him, you know, I was in trouble, and I gave him the story, you know, as far as, you know, the voice that I heard telling me that I had to leave the land, you know, that I grew up in there, you know, and go build my father's house with gold that I was to find. Uh, it took me a long time to realize that it wasn't talking about real yellow gold. It was more or less talking of the scriptures themselves, and I just discovered that here just a few years ago. I'm sitting there saying, you know, Father, you know, Yahshua, you know, why is it you called me out here, you know, out of, the, out of my father's house, out of the land that I love, because I, I do love upstate New York. I, I don't care for the city much at all, but upstate New York is a wonderful place. Anyway, you know, I explained everything to the guy, and he called up his field hand and had him come on out, take a look at my van. Then they invited me in to breakfast, and he had a daughter and a son there, you know, very, very nice family. And after I explained everything to the farmer, then I explained everything to the field hand, then I had to explain everything to the family over breakfast, and everybody was totally amazed. Uh, I didn't really understand what was going on at that time. It just didn't really click in my head, you know, how close I was to death. But apparently the farmer and his hand and the farmer's wife, they understood totally. And it cost about 300 and no, oh, I think it was $325 or $315, something like that, to get the new axle, the whole, you know, it came with the springs and everything. The whole piece had to come out and a new uh, steering column and everything else uh, came to about 300, eh, let's just say $325. Well, the farmer and his field hand went out to the junkyard. They uh, dismantled the Volkswagen bus they had out there and they bought the part, put it on the truck, came back, they fixed my van and they wouldn't charge me a penny for gas that they used for the time or anything else because they felt it would be a a big uh, problem for them if they were to do so because they really thought it was a man Yahweh or Jesus anyway at that time. So anyway, I had left that place. I was very grateful to the family. I, I was very grateful. They got me back on the road. I took off on my way back to Colorado or to Colorado the first time. And I ended up up by Denver. There was a place called Clear Creek and I did a whole lot of gold mining. I had a five pound peanut butter jar and it was probably a, oh about a third of the way filled with gold and it had some nice weight to it. I thought it was getting pretty close to at least building a little house for my father. And uh, one night I heard the van door open and some guy grabbed my shotgun which I kept loaded next to the door and he apparently knew it because uh, he must have been a miner himself and seen my stash that I had. So shotgun barrel, needless to say, was put in my mouth and uh, I was able to keep my shotgun. The guy did take the bullet out, threw it out by his car as he took off, but I never seen the gold and I never seen the guy again. Of course, I was very devastated. I was uh, eating beans for months, you know, while I was mining. And it's not easy to even boil beans up there on top of that mountain there near Denver. It takes quite a while to boil anything. But uh, from there I 
decided I had better just pack up and leave, so I ended up in Las Vegas, Nevada, Sin City, and I was living on the streets there, and I was uh, quite hungry, you know, I, I never knew how to ask anything from anybody, I was brought up that if you want a handout, the best place to look is right at the end of your arm, you know, so I ran into a fella named Paul Gofforth, and I believe he's now deceased, but he was an old man when I picked him up. Uh, he had a bad limp, he used to be a musician, and he sold uh, homes for Walter Holmes. Uh, used to build them for him and everything else. And I ended up, you know, taking him with me in the van, and we moved up to the top of uh, Mount Potosi. Now, Mount Potosi is uh, a beautiful place. It used to be an old silver mine, and had giant boulders up there and everything, and they had signs, you know, posted to stay out of the mine, and I never went in there. But where we had stayed, where I parked my van, was a nice level area. They had uh, wild horses and wild donkeys. They had uh, wild uh, cattle. Uh, I don't know if they ever had any buffalo or anything like that, but they had chuckers and, uh, you know, some pheasants. They had different kinds of birds, rabbits, and, you know, just all kinds of wildlife because right there where we parked was a beautiful pond. Uh, they had a big old... Uh, black pipe almost as big around as you know my bottle here that came up out of the ground and it, it was from a naturally fed spring ice cold at that and the water would shoot out for oh 10 or 15 feet before it hit the water you know off into the pond and the water was just pristine you know we would take the water from the pipe that it, as it came out you know for our cooking and things of that sort but all throughout the pond was laced with this marvelous watercress so we had fresh you know salads anytime we wanted them we had animals that uh, you know little varmints I had a 22 and I also had my shotgun so we, we had things to eat and two times a week we go down into Sin City Las Vegas and we'd sell our plasma uh, that's one thing that Paul showed me how to do I never knew anything about that before and of course after you sell plasma the first time of the week was five bucks second time that you sell it and they only let you sell it twice you get ten bucks well from the money that we generated from that we go over to a place called the pepper mill and in that area it was on Bonanza Drive uh, where it was located they had a bunch of uh, Jesus saved ministries and all different kinds of little churches that we would go in every time we went in to sell our blood and, and I'd make a day and you know We'd leave in the evening time because I made sure that any time church services was going on, I was there. I was so thirsty, so hungry for truth. Of course, I read the scriptures continuously, but to hear somebody else speak about them was just so much more inspirational for me. And I would take the meat, you know, that I knew was in the scriptures. Some meat they did feed, and I'd spit out the bones, you know, all the stuff that I knew was, you know, just a, a bunch of lies. But this one day, this one night, I found a, uh, a Book of John, it was called. You know, it was a little pamphlet, you know, one of the four books of the Glad Tidings, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or Yachanan. So I picked up that little booklet, and I was rather excited to get it. Even though I had several Bibles with me, I was excited to get that little booklet. And when we went back up to camp that night after cooking supper, and it got real cold. It was probably about 20 degrees out, I guess, on top of that mountain. And I got up in the back of my Volkswagen van. Paul, he slept across the front seats, you know, because it, was, uh, it wasn't a bench seat, but we had a piece of plywood that we put there with uh, cushions that he could, you know, stretch out comfortably. I was always balled up because I'm so tall, you know, the back of the van I was squunched up in. But that night I started reading that book of John, or Yachanan. And I got to chapter 4 and it was quite amazing to me because I couldn't really understand everything it was talking about when it got to the lady at the well and, uh, you know, the Messiah was talking about the waters that he had that you would never thirst again. And I'm like, well, what in the world does this mean? And I remember that very night when I got that booklet of John, or Yachanan, that uh, the preacher was standing there, and he says, uh, 
You know, he says, if there's any time that you are reading your scriptures and you don't understand, you know, what it's talking about, he says, just pray to your Heavenly Father and he'll show you what it's talking about. So, of course, what did I do? I went ahead and I, I prayed to my Heavenly Father, you know, and at that time I called him God and I called him Lord. You know, I didn't know I was calling him Baal, you know, but uh, Yahweh does wink at our ignorance. But then when it's time to repent, you know, it's time to stick your nose to the grindstone, which I've done for many years. But anyway, I prayed and asked, you know, to show me what that was talking about, you know, the, uh, the waters that I'd never thirst again. Even the woman there at the well was like, sir, what are these waters that I would never have to come back here, you know, with my jug and this and that and the other thing. I sure would like to have some of those. And, you know, Messiah kind of chuckled it off, you know, but I still couldn't understand. And I read it. And I read it and I read it. So I prayed again. And then I'd pray again and I'd read and I'd pray again and I'd read and I'd pray again. And eventually I got pretty upset and I'm like, look, damn it, you know. Your preacher here that you put down here to let me know all I had to do was pray and you would show me, well, what in the world is wrong? Can't you hear my voice? Ain't I high enough out, you know, this mountain here that you can't hear me? And I was upset. I, I really was. And I kind of feel ashamed of it. But I was like chewing some, you know, chewing some butt, so I thought. And then it was kind of peculiar because it was like all of a sudden... I was like I wasn't even in my body anymore, <coughs> but it felt like I floated up off my bed, and the little light that I had up in the top, because it was night and very cold, it seemed like it had gone off, and then I don't know if I was floating down something or if the something was floating past me. And I've thought about this thousands of times, you know, and I've told this story hundreds of times, but I still can't differentiate whether I was doing the floating or it was, you know, I don't know. But for the argument's sake, you know, I'll just say that I was floating down this here thing, but it was pitch black. I mean, I, I was looking around and I couldn't see anything, nothing at all. It was just the darkest dark I've ever seen in my life. And... It felt as though that darkness was my life. <laughs> I know that's kind of hard to explain, but I wasn't in my body at the time, I don't believe. And as I was floating down this thing, for quite some time, it probably took what seemed four or five minutes anyway to where I could see this real faint light way up at the end. And I was wondering, man, you know, it looked like a candle, you know, 10 football fields away or whatever. And I kept floating down, or it floated, I kept floating down, and the light kept getting brighter and brighter. And finally, around me, I could see that I was in this cobblestone tunnel. It was, you know, and it reminded me of where I grew up at in Durhamville, New York. They got these cobblestone tunnels that go up underneath the Erie Canal where they used to have, you know, donkeys uh, pulling the boats, the barges up the canal. But they had little areas where different canals would also go under or streams and brooks would go up underneath the Erie Canal. And they had these cobblestone tunnels. And that's basically what it, it really felt like or appeared as if it was to me. So I kept getting closer and closer to this light, and the light kept getting brighter and brighter. I mean, I felt comfortable in the complete darkness because that was my life, but I was coming into this new light that made my heart hurt. I mean, it really deep, it just, it pained me. And I knew that what was going on was that was from the drugs, the alcohol, the sins, the lies, the everything I did, and I was a chief at all sin. I'll tell you what, before I was called, I was a chief all sin. If I can get away with it, I was going to do it. You know, it was exciting, the adrenaline rush, everything else around, you know, surrounding it. Plus, you know, all my friends were of the same mind for the most part, and birds of a feather flock together. But anyway, with this light, Man, it was hurting my heart, and it was so bright, but yet I could look at it, and the only, it didn't hurt my eyes, it hurt my heart. And I'm like, wow, what in the world is this place? Well, 
then I saw in the light a figure that was starting to come up to where the light, it was like the light was like a door almost, I mean, it really didn't shine that much out, it just was a light that stood there, but gave a little light to the darkness so I could see the cobblestones. I know that's kind of hard to understand, but that's just the way this was. So I'm watching, and it felt like I wasn't floating on my back anymore, but I kind of like came up to where I was more or less standing, but my feet weren't on the ground. And then I seen this figure come out of the light, and he came up and he's like this, okay? And he had these things on, you know, he had tassels on. And I noticed he had holes in his wrists and in his feet. And I could see that as he stepped through, you know, I could see from the light behind and the light going through was, you know, from his... I could see the light behind his foot where he had holes in his feet. And I did the same with the wrist, I could see it, but I really couldn't see his face. I know he had a beard, I know he had hair on the top of his head, and from what I could tell, it was like purple robes that he was wearing. And like I say, he had the seat seats on, because that's a commandment of our Father. You can find in uh, Numbers chapter 15, right after the guy that was uh, picking up sticks in the Sabbath, and he got caught, and they were going to stone him. Well, surely you could imagine. He's like, oh, no, don't kill me. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. I didn't remember. You're going to kill me for picking up a couple sticks? Well, he ended up getting stoned anyway. But the next verse after that is where Yahweh commanded his children to wear the tassels, to wear the seat seats or the fringes, the lots. They're all called by, but I'll just call them the fringes. And that's what the Messiah was touched on by that one woman that had an issue for many years and she came up and grabbed a hold of his fringe on his garment because you're supposed to wear these in the four corners. They're supposed to be with any color thread, doesn't matter, except only one strand of blue. You don't need royal blue. You don't need the blue that's... Hey, little respect here, will you? Thank you very much. But anyway, you know, a lot of the Jews, you know, they're trying to say, well, you know, you got to have this certain snail, and they're having a problem finding it. Well, the snail is unclean to begin with, so what you dye with it remains unclean. You can't make it clean. Uh, you know, it's just something that can't be done. You can't take something that's unclean and make it clean, except by certain prescriptions, you know, in the scriptures, by washing it with water. But still, you got that dead animal that stained it. That's part of the dead carcass, so, you know, you're not to use that. But any color blue, one strand, and then a bunch of other strands. It doesn't matter how many other strands you have, but just one strand of blue, and you're to make uh, tassels for the four corners of your garment. And the purpose of these is when you grab a hold of these in time of distress, or, you know, you're stressed out, or, you know, you just found out that somebody took your bank account, you know, and and they weren't even supposed to take it, but it's a government thing, and they want to build these uh, underground passages, so they're, you know, robbing the people blind, you know. But anyway, what these tassels are for is when you grab a hold of them, it is a reminder of the 613 laws or the 610 laws, however many they are, but the commandments and the laws, when you grab a hold of these, that's what they're there for is to remind you of that, to keep you in the way. I mean, here the fellow out there with the sticks, if he would have had these to begin with, he may not have been picking up sticks in the Sabbath. But then again, it wouldn't have been that great of an example as to why you are to wear 